My name is Megan DiGiorgio. I'm the Director of Education Advancement for Boulanger Initiative. And I can't tell you how excited I am to welcome you to our very first solo instrument, virtual solo instrument composition workshop. Um, these, this is the first workshop, but not the last. There will be five more after this. And they're all taking place as a part of our Elizabeth Henriksen Professional Development Mentorship Program, um, which is generally geared towards early stage composers. But for these workshops, we get to work with even younger students, which is really, really exciting. Um, so just a brief background about what these workshops are. Uh, young composers aged 13 to 18, generally, who are young women or of marginalized genders are able to submit little um, approximately one minute long compositions for any of these solo instruments that we feature on these workshops. So tonight it'll be piano and we have other instruments coming up in the future. Um, they get to hear these pieces performed by a Boulanger Initiative Performance Ambassador, and then they get to receive feedback on them from one of our composer mentors. So tonight, I'm super, super excited to uh, introduce Sophia Kim Cook, who is our Performance Ambassador, and Nina C. Young, who is our composer mentor. I will just really quickly uh, let you know about some of our upcoming workshops. So these are all going to take place on Tuesday evenings from seven to nine uh, Eastern time, just like right now. So a week from today, we have a clarinet workshop with um, Alexandra Gardner is going to be our composer mentor. On October 19th, we have viola with Nina again. And on October 26th, we're gonna have a violin workshop with Inti Figus Vizueta. And there are a couple more after that. You can find all of this information on our website about the workshops and about the mentorship program as a whole. Um, and one other event I just wanna uh, let you know about is we have a composition masterclass, also virtual with Nina. And that will be for the composers who are a part of the mentorship program for the long haul. They're getting six months of professional development mentorship from our mentors, Nina being one of them, um, and they're all going to have their music workshopped at that time. So again, you can go to our website and find out more information about everything I just said, but for right now, I just wanna get right into tonight's event. Um, so with the first piece we are going to hear is an excerpt from a piece called Cascade written by Alison Ziegler. So I'm gonna invite her up on stage. And then we will, hello, welcome Alison. Hi. Great to see you in this virtual space. Um, so we're gonna hear the piece performed and then have a little conversation about it. Alrighty. Shall I start playing first and then we can talk or did you want to um, say a little bit about the piece? Sure, I'll say a tiny bit about the piece. So Cascade in C Major is one of my latest piano developments and it's a big three page piece, but of course I only had to do one page. And it, my idea was this kind of like a waterfall, which you can see with a lot of the arpeggios in the left hand. Okay. Let's hear it. Thank 
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sophia. Uh, and congratulations, Allison. It's really Thanks. a gr great start to a piece. And um, I have a feeling where, that I might know where it, it's going next. Um, so what are, you, do you, what are your initial reactions? Um, I, it sounds so cool having someone have their take on it and play it how it would be played and really just well done because it sounded awesome. Thank you, and thank you. <laughs> yeah, I think the voicings are really beautiful um, and set um, in a nice register uh, for the, the instruments and the developments. You started with voicings that are closer together um, in the first few phrases. Uh, and then I really like how when we get to the middle, uh, the end of the third system, uh, once we have the more cascading arpeggios that are going up and down, we get to hear the octave doublings, which bring an extra sense of reinforcement to the melodic line. And I think that was a really excellent choice. Um, I'm curious, uh, in the next part of the piece, do you envision going and expanding the register, particularly in the left hand, to explore the lower octave of the piano below where you've written? Um, in the second and third pages, it does do some things in that lower octave than what is shown mm -hmm. to kind of continue that. Yeah, that's, I think that's a really good idea. I mean, one of the compositional tools that we have to play with is register. Um, and this is something that you can use to emphasize feeling, emotion, form, and structure throughout a composition. Um, Subsequently, you know, when we get to the end of the last system before we get to page two and three, what I enjoy is that the melodic line or the right hand as we see it goes down into a register of the piano that we really haven't heard the melody in yet. Um, and what I think might be a nice addition once the phrase continues to, to move along would be to actually turn this arpeggiated pattern more into a rocking pattern in the middle register so we can feel almost like what would happen after the water falls. You know, there's the, the big tension mm -hmm. in a waterfall and then there's the water that collects in the basin. And that's always, you know, it's intention, it's rippling back into the initial waterfall and out of into like the river or the lake or yeah. the holding place. Um, and we could have this feeling of rocking which would give us a, almost a sense of stability for a moment. And then later on in the piece, you can go back to the expanded gesture, but the idea of squishing everything together for a moment. So Sophie, I was, I'm wondering um, if you, we look at measure 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, um, actually 34 into 35. We see in the left hand, we have the C sharp, the A, and then the A goes down again to the other octave. What if that second A was a half note and then you took the D minor-ish arpeggio in the following uh, measure and maybe did a different pattern with that? Hmm. Does that make sense? Okay. So maybe we, we, like, we can start somewhere to get into it. Yeah, so I'll start at um, 31, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we can notice how much that signals a character change. I mean, you have a key change that's happening here. Um, but this idea of let's hold our breath for a second and break the rhythmic pattern that we're so used to. And it's, it's a mode of developing. So we're developing the idea of 
the theme of arpeggio. So it's really interesting, I think, in your piece. Your piece has a melody, but one of the biggest identifying features, and even you talked about it, Allison, is the arpeggio. And so, um, you know, I, I think of Haydn and Beethoven as some of the um, composers that are so excellent at their development sections, right? We learn the melodies from the beginning and then we're always like, wow, look what they did there. It's so exciting, this journey in the development. Um, and so you can think about your own work that way because you can be just like them. <laughs> <laughs> Is there um, a section of the piece in this first page where you were debating something or you weren't quite sure what you were doing um, that you felt a little bit un... Is this... A little... Well, for, I'm is first it, asking Is this Allison. a question for me? Yeah. Sorry, I, it broke up. For, for Allison. Allison, okay. Uh, yeah. Originally, there was a spot where I had a different melody when I went into D minor. Then I realized that kind of be like, multiple melodies and they might kind of mesh together in an odd way. So you, you wouldn't really have a melody to hold on to. Mm -hmm. So I decided to just change it and keep it as the same pattern that appeared before. I see. Yep. It's good to be able to edit your own work. Um, and now I'm curious to hear from Sophia. Do you, can you give us some comments um, and recommendations? Or feelings. First, how did how did feeling your fingers? Actually fits really nicely in my. Yeah, um, it felt really nice. Sometimes we get stretched a lot, so it was a nice feeling just to 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 play. Um, and those arpeggios are beautiful. And then I think I really like the measure seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, where you kind of cluster them. So it, it like Nina said about the waterfall, it kind of feels like it's clustering there, and then we kind of move back on to a bigger. Uh, waterfall section. Um, I had a question about measure 31, 32, 33, 35 going into the key change. Um, you saw that I naturally did a retardando into the new key. Is that something that you were thinking or were you, was your vision, oh no, we're just going to go straight into the new key? That actually worked quite nicely. I hadn't thought of putting a retard there but it okay. did work really well mm -hmm. into the piece. Mm -hmm. Right, great. Um, so, so Sophia, can you Usually explain... when I see a key... Sure. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, um, no, go ahead. So I think you're answering my question. A... Oh, <laughs> so when I see a key change in a piece, um, sometimes we want to get into it and other times we want to prepare the audience for the key change so that's why the, the i was asking about the question did you want me to lead into it softly like i did the way i interpreted the piece or um if you wanted it um straight into it but you answered my question so thank you sophia if let's say that allison did not want any tempo change in the score there, what would you like to see written to signal that to you? I would probably put a, a poco accelerando in it um, because a natural tendency will, as a, a pianist, will be to prepare that. So if you put a tiny little poco accelerando, then I would, go, uh, sorry. So do you, do you see how I'm leading into the key change? Mm -hmm. And the way I did it initially was So it changes the flavor completely. Mm -hmm. It really does. Those are two, it makes the piece feel like this next uh, key change section are gonna be radically different. Mm -hmm. One feels kind of energetic going into it and the other one is, is a, it brings a level of sort of introspection uh, to, the, to the sound world. 
I um, just jump in super quick, just with a slight housekeeping um, thing. Uh, Sophia, would you be able to change your audio input to be your laptop rather than your AirPods? Because I think and that might be iPad. Is okay. Oh, sure. iPad. Yeah. And the output can still stay as your as your AirPods. Just the input might help. Allison, what is your primary instrument? How is that? My primary instrument is piano, but I also play violin and cornet and a tiny bit of organ, and I recently started French horn. Wow. So I am all over the board, so to speak. That's very good for instrumentation and orchestration. It Should we really do a little does. sound test? Megan, is that better? Um, I'm not sure we'll be able to tell until we hear you play, because speaking, you sound great. But then I okay. think because the sound was coming through your AirPods, the playing right. wasn't the most clear. I see. Okay. So we will we'll we'll figure it out as we go. Yes. We'll go with the water. <laughs> I wonder if maybe we can um, do a second run through of Cascade, if that's okay. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Um, Allison, I have a question about the trill and why we only have one trill in measure three and there aren't any anywhere else. So that was kind of, I was thinking of that small beginning section as kind of like you're flowing in the river to the waterfall. And that little trill is like a fish in the river swimming by. There's some other tiny movement that might offset it slightly. Are you, is that a feature that you're going to develop later on in the piece? Maybe. I think just like the arpeggio, you use it as um, a big constructive tool. Maybe we can see what happens to that fish and its friends later on. Maybe. <laughs> um, and another question I have for you, um, when you choose uh, right hand chord voicings. How did you decide which notes should be closer together, thirds, and which should be sixths and or octaves? Part of it honestly was based off of what would be on the easier side to play and not like stretching her, your hand in an awkward position. But I also wanted to make sure that that middle note kind of had a melody of its own and wasn't like all over the place. I, I think that you were very successful um, in this. And I think that's part of the ease that Sophia is talking about. Um, but I like the fact that you feel in the harmonic language uh, and it's not empty. It, the music in some ways reminds me very much of some Debussy and Ravel uh, in that way. Um, and I think, for example, if we look in measure 28, um, I like the fact that the middle note, the E that we have in the right hand, uh, 
it's suspended for a moment. And then we have the eighth notes, the A and the C happening on beat three. And then all of those culminate together on the actually the upper line, which resolves that E from the previous line. So trying mm -hmm. to find these little melodic games in the voices and how you can combine um, things that seems like secondary voices and let them flower out into primary ones is a really great compositional tool. Um, so for example, in measure 31, I'm a little bit curious what happens to that F Well, the F sharp actually kind of takes it from that arpeggio in the left hand in measure 31 to changing it to the F sharp major chord tra mm -hmm. transition it to the key. So it kind of is the connecting point between those two measures. Good answer. Uh, and lastly, uh, Sophia, what do you, can you talk a little bit about the pedal markings? Oh, um, are they helpful? Yes, yes. Um, the I think you could have maybe I mean if you wanted to you could have written one pedal in the first measure, and then write S I M similar mm -hmm. all the way through until you get to bar nine. But that's just you know detail. But um, the the pedal markings are actually helpful because um, sometimes you have pedal markings that are in the middle of the bar, um, but um, sometimes my initial um, inclination would be to just do it at the beginning of the bar. So you writing it out is making it very clear to me what your vision is for the, for the how you want the harmonics to uh, play together uh, when we mesh all, all those notes together. So good job. Um, and I'm curious uh, about in the first system, you can see Sophia that Allison has the bass note tied over into beats two and three. Uh, yes. Do you think that's necessary or could it be a quarter note and then half notes with the pedal marking? Oh, you mean in measure seven and eight? In measure one through eight. So everything in the first system, you can see how the bass note is tied oh, yeah. You can over. Just, yeah, you can just write the quarter note and then just the, the half note. That's how Chopin yeah. does it. Right, yeah. Yeah, so Allison, I think the detail that you're showing uh, is really useful. And if there weren't pedal markings, so for example, if you wanted the left hand chord to resonate over the course of the entire measure, mm -hmm. but you wanted to not carry the resonance of the melodic line with the pedal, then your notation with the tie would work really well and you would have no pedal marking there. But because you have the pedal marking, everything is gonna blur together and that doesn't change the voicing of the chord. Right. And the pedal marking is actually helpful just because if we didn't have it, and I assumed that you wanted it dry, I actually wouldn't be able to hold on to the A and go all the way to the C just because my hands are not big enough, right? So it would change the, the it would be, actually, it would be quite impossible for me to do that. <laughs> so pedals are good. And how about an expression marking in the beginning? So you write quarter equals 90. Um, do you think there's maybe some character words that go around with tempo that could key uh, someone like Sophia into how to interpret your piece? I mean, I think you talked about waterfalls. Uh, so I have some ideas. I don't really know what you could put as a word. Maybe like sweetly or something to kind of represent that like, Soft, slow, but also yet nice feeling. Mm -hmm. How about flowing? Ooh, that would work. And I think sometimes we can think that flowing is very fast. Um, so if you want, you, you when you were just expressing your intention, you mentioned 
a little bit of slowness, that it's not tumbling over itself, but it's cascading at a kind of a reasonable tempo. Mm -hmm. So I think having the metronome mark is really important, but maybe you could say uh, sweetly and flowing or sweetly flowing or, you know, some other words. Mm -hmm. What I like to do when I'm trying to find an expressive tempo marking uh, or a way to describe exactly what it is that I want in the piece, I'll often brainstorm a little bit about things that I that I feel, and then I'll go to thesaurus.com and I'll put the words that are in my brainstorm in there to see if there are some words that kind of encapsulate all of them together. Uh, so that's like another compositional exploration that can be fun. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you very much, Allison, and congratulations Great on job. the first part of your piece. <laughs> And thank well, you, Sophia, for your beautiful interpretation. And thank you for giving me feedback. I found it very useful. I'm glad. <laughs> awesome. Well, congratulations. Yes, I echo everything that was just said. Beautiful piece. Um, yeah. So I think we can move on to our next piece. Um, so this is an excerpt from a piece called In My Head, written by Elisa Johnson who is going to join us on stage. Hello. Hi. Hello, Elisa. So I have, um, from your submission, I have a little blurb about what the piece is about, but yeah. you might as well go ahead and you're here, so you might as well go sure. ahead and tell us about it. OK. Um, <laughs> so this piece is about being frustrated that you have no ideas for a piece. Um, I thought. <laughs> Because that's how I was feeling when I was, you know, trying to write something for this composition intensive that I was in. Um, I was there over the summer and I was like, I have no ideas. This is awful. I can't do this. And so I was like, you know, this is, I'm, when I write music, I'm inspired by strong emotions. And so I was like, this is a strong emotion. I'm just going to write a piece about it. Okay. Well, let's hope this is what's in your head. <laughs> That's very exciting. And thank you, yeah. Sophia, for this rigorous performance. Um, and, and yeah, this is a trickier piece than the last one to play. Yeah. Um, there's lots of acrobatics and the fast tempo. Yes. Uh, Elisa, how do you feel? Um, that was that was amazing. I mean, I like I didn't really know what it was. I kind of knew what it was going to sound like going in, but you never really do know until you hear it. So. Yeah, that was, that's kind of exactly what I was hoping it would be, yeah. Uh, Elisa, what is your instrument? Um, I play piano and I sing. Did you write this at the piano? Yes. Okay, so you listen to the sounds on the piano and on MIDI or just on piano? Um, both, I would say. One of the things that I find um, when moving from, let's just say MIDI to live performance is the depth of sound that you get from even uh, basic dyads. So 
So, you know, in the left hand, uh, you have a lot of two note passages mm -hmm. um, and they can sound a little tinny and empty, but the actual resonance of the piano when it's a true acoustic instrument and a larger instrument brings so much guts and edge to the sound. Um, and I think that uh, that's what I'm asking because I think your ability to keep a lot of empty space in certain parts of the piano while other parts of the piano are doing things is a really nice feature. You know, you don't have all the hands playing all the time. Uh, and that I think that's a strength of the piece. And also in, in, in a piece as fast and ferocious as this one, um, gives Sophia time to reset uh, and get ready for the next thing. And the, re the reset was, was important just in this case just because we got it on Sunday. So I'm like, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> so um, so I want to start uh, the conversation, uh, Elisa, for your piece with Sophia and to ask about um, how this sits in the fingers and if there are regions or passages where you feel like you're tripping up a little bit or that, you know, freak you out in the approach. Um, it actually fits very nicely in the hands. Um, I mean, the only tricky part would uh, is just a practice issue on my part, um, like measure 20 and 23, which is the same mirrored one. Uh, you'd need just a little time to practice it, you know. Um, but other than that, it feels really nice. Um, and I really like the, the contrast between measure 23 um, and then going into the end of 24 when you have that lyrical bass line and suddenly you've got the pop of, I don't know, like, maybe early jazz, and kind of want to do this. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, I did have a question about the first measure, sure. uh, the fifth one and the uh, tenth measure. Yeah. Um, so how I played it was I put the um, sustenuto pedal, the middle pedal, and played the chord, held it, and then did the staccato. Yes. Or were you envisioning? No, I, I was envisioning the sustenuto, the first one. Okay. So yes. um, it would be helpful if you put like an S-O-S-T right there um, marking so okay. that the pianist won't approach it as. Obviously, it's very different from. Yeah. So it goes for all three measures, one, five, and 10? Yes. OK, great. Thank you. Thank you so much for bringing up the pedaling question, Sophia. Um, I think that this is a conversation that is a good one to have in a piano workshop. The idea of how much is too much and how much is too little pedaling and why? Because um, especially for composers who are not primarily performing pianists, um, we can tend to over notate pedaling in impractical ways. Um, and then oftentimes people who are, are really great pianists will be like, oh, well, it's assumed that this will be the pedaling because you're bringing your own knowledge of the performance practice. Uh, into the writing. But the fact of the matter is every composer here doesn't have a performance practice yet around your music. You know, you're new on the scene and not enough musicians have spent hundreds of years debating how to read your scores to know that when you write a staccato note that me, uh, Elisa actually means that it should be played this way. You know, we can think about uh, the difference between playing Rachmaninoff and Mozart. Uh, there are two drastically different approaches. Um, and so as you know, new kids on the block, we need to um, be very careful about this. And so one of the things that I like to do as a composer is, of course, I have my sound world in mind. I also like to be open to what another interpreter, an artist, right? The interpreters are artists. We, we like composers, we're just making scores. It's really the artists who are making the music happen. And so they might have another idea 
But then I ask myself, I'm like, okay, if that other idea, what would the other ideas be? And if the other idea would really bug me, then this is a time when I have to write specifically what I intend. Got it. Yeah, uh, I think that's, um, that's a great thing to say. Um, I think that's why I brought it up with Allison when I was talking about um, pedaling and when the composer writes pedaling for the second beat instead of the first beat, I know that that's actually very important. So, but if you write pedals everywhere, um, and I mean, it's, it's a lot easier for pianists if you see head and then sim so that you know it just kind of repeats because our eyes are, you know, there's a lot of notes. <laughs> so, um, but if you do write a marking head somewhere differently, then we know that it's really important for the harmonic structure. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Elisa, I also want to compliment you on your use of dynamics as contrast. Um, so in uh, Allison, I was talking about the use of a register as being a really important compositional element. Um, and I think for in your piece, there's a lot of registral play as well, but you're using dynamics and articulation as ways of growing different characters that make up the tapestry of this music. You know, I, I actually think about um, a, a bunch of people dancing when I'm listening to this. We have the big beginning and then the people who are uh, together uh, kind of like undulating on the staccato quarter notes. And then we have the quirky lines in the right hand. Um, we have the syncopations, which I, I, in my head, I envision another band. And they're all different shapes and sizes together making this piece that's in your head. Um, and, and I think that's very exciting. And I wanna compliment you on that. Uh, it's, it's a great feature of the piece. Uh, and I'm sure, uh, Sophia, it gives you a lot of room to develop these different sounds as well. Yes, yes. Um, and also, I do like that you repeat the same patterns and then develop them later. Um, it, 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 as a performer, it kind of gives us a, a somewhere to hold on to so that we just it doesn't feel new every bar, right? Yeah. Um, so that, that was really cool. Um, and then one spot where I think that as the piece goes on, it's not a problem yet, but it might become a problem later. So I'm gonna just point this out and there might be some ways to keep the intent that you want um, while helping out people to perform this and actually interpret like the audience to understand the rhythms that you want. Like, so we just listened to this piece while looking at the score. If we move on to page three of the score uh, on the video screen, if it's possible to take a look at that. Um, on page three, next page, sorry, it's actually score page four, yeah. Um, we'll, you'll see uh, in measures 20 and 22, the syncopation, which is really exciting. Um, so we see the 16th note syncopation. Now, because we are humans and not robots, sometimes it's hard to understand the mcha, 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 mcha if we don't have, so the cha, 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 if we don't have the mm. Right. Okay. And yeah, and because you are holding over uh, and the pick up to 20, you're holding over the right hand eighth note of the line. This is blurring our expectation of the downbeat. Now, in this case, it was actually, in these two measures, I think it's actually kind of okay because we understand the pulse of running 16th notes as a result of what's happening in the left hand. So I'm still like, da 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 da, and I know that there's gonna be the da 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 da. Uh, and so I understand the excitement of this syncopation, which is super cool. It's like this whole other character and it's, it's a little jarring because it's not what we expect the music to do. And, expe and, and thwarting expectation is so exciting in music. We're like, oh, I, I know what's gonna happen. Whoa, we, they didn't do that. We got a syncopation, how cool. And as a performer, this, is some, this part would be something we would obsess over to get it right because we're excited to play the unexpected part of it 
obviously if it continues forever, then we'll be like, oh no. <laughs> but just to have that, um, it, it's great. And that would be something that we'd need to practice to coordinate. Mm -hmm. So this is an idea that you very smartly continue to develop onto the next page. So if we let the PDF on the screen go to the next page, you see you have the right hand, do 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 and chut and chut. Um, and then this continues in the measure right underneath it and the measure under right underneath it and the measure right underneath that. Now I was, Sophia, this is not a criticism at all. I was noticing as these were progressing, I started to, as a listener, hear them more like one and and, so one and three, yeah. mm -hmm. rather than as two and four. Right. Yeah. Uh, so the way that, and, and I think that this is inevitable. There's no way to practice it enough where, because the, the tempo, we're working with 16th notes and our human brain understands that rubato is a thing. So we're constantly adjusting and our brains are making us want those to be one and three on the grid instead of two and four on the 16th note grid. So one of the things that you could do is interject something wild on the one. So we hear, uh, so for example, one thing that could happen is maybe a really low note, dry, dry, very sec, or low note somewhere. To a, yeah. Exactly. Or if you wanted to do, this would be a little harder with the spacing, but another thing you could do is play with that and actually do some cluster high up on the piano where the left hand crosses over while the right hand is doing the syncopations. Mm, or you might have to revoice it. Yeah. Whoa. That's cool. Yeah. That was great. You're awesome. Or a mix of like the low notes, you know, and it's just like something that's back. saying like, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, hold on. Maybe we can take it down a little notch too, if you want. Sorry? We can take it down a tempo notch if you want. Yeah. Yeah, so something that's going to uh, put a rhythmic marker in the place of beat one of, well, I, I suppose like the, the strong of beat three, but it's not going to interrupt the line. So if you did something just in that register, it would lose all excitement. We'd be like, oh, cool. It's a really neat lick. But this adds a little bit of like an accented emphasis. And we could go back earlier in the piece and see a lot of the more articulated gestures, even the opening as inspiring that. Um, so it's like, oh, let's bring those little characters to come and like, you know, play a crazy simple going like, ah, and then the line comes in with the syncopations. This this whole, the last, the last page reminds, um, it's very orchestral in my mind, uh, or maybe it's just because I'm playing so many reductions, um, but I can imagine it being scored for orchestra. Um, okay. so that, wow. Yeah, and then the, the percussion hits of what Nina was talking about. You can have lots of options. So maybe Wow, we, Sophia, that's such a great idea. I mean, you can write it for solo piano, and then you can be the one to orchestrate it for orchestra, too. I mean, there are plenty well, of composers that do that. Yeah. Yeah, and then you can submit that piece to orchestral readings, um, and it's a, a different uh, piece. You know, uh, the Mussorgsky's pictures at an exhibition, which we all mostly know as an orchestra piece, or it's more no well known, is actually originally a piano piece. Um, and the, the orchestra version that we know, uh, Ravel orchestrated, but Mussorgsky also did orchestration. It's just not quite <laughs> as <laughs> great. Um, but there's there's no there's nothing to be shy about uh, 
using that. Um, also, when, when thinking about orchestration, if you know a piece already stands on its two legs as a piano piece, so you know like the form of the piece works, then you can become very exploratory with your orchestration and you don't have to worry that you've spent all this time on a giant orchestra piece that just flops. Yeah. Okay. I might do that. Elisa, do you have any questions specifically about the piece or to ask Sophia? Um, I don't think so. I think um, I think this this was really, really helpful. Um, I learned a lot and I'm excited to see what I'm gonna do with this next. Me too. And I, I like your title. Yeah. <laughs> um, actually, yeah. it's very relatable. We've all been in situations, you know, in a big group or something, someone comes in and they say, let's talk about so, such and such. And you're just like, it's my turn, it's my turn, what's going on in my head? Uh -huh. and this piece would probably come out, you know? So, mm -hmm. Great job. I wonder, Sophia, if you have it in your fingers, do you think we could go through it one more time? Oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Let's let's do that. Brava. Oh, congratulations, uh, yes. Elisa. Thank, thank you, thank you Sophia. Yeah, excellent. And and yeah, wonderful feedback. Um, all right. So our next piece that we're going to hear is an excerpt from Garden Suite. And this was written by Jordan Hendrickson, who's not going to join us on stage. Um, but I know a little bit about the piece. So the full piece is eight minutes long and it's in three movements. This excerpt that we're going to hear is from the first movement, which is titled Leaves. And um, they say about their own piece that this works as like a standalone section, which is why this is um, the excerpt that they submitted. So I think with that, we can get started on it. That was beautiful, Sophia. Thank you. Bravo. Thank you. Jordan. Yes, congratulations, Jordan. And um, I have my eyes on the chat if you want to interject at all and we can uh, discuss some of the questions you might pose. Uh, I think this, uh, it's beautiful in its rocking nature um, and we as listeners uh, get two distinct lines, um, a little bit uh, similar to the worlds that Allison created in the first piece. We have the rocking nature of the left hand motion weaving in and out. 
And then these interjections, sometimes complete melodic phrases, and sometimes these little fragments, uh, roots, seedlings, leaves that are just fluttering um, in the upper, upper register. Uh, and because the lines are sometimes short, we're looking for the connections and we get this very spacious feel. Um, and I think that's a result of both the registral distribution, uh, the melodic right hand material is primarily um, an octave above the middle register of the piano. So we get this very brilliant crystalline sound with the more, um, I suppose, alto uh, middle line that, that allows us to be more legato in character. Sophia, when you're in the higher, as we go higher and higher up in the instrument, how does the notion of legato change? Like for example, if we go super, super high yes. uh, into the upper, upper, upper register of the piano. I have to work a little bit harder um, to make it more caramelly, if that makes sense. Maybe I'm just hungry, <laughs> but more, more sticky. So I, I just and, have to work a little harder. Yeah, and that's because the strings are shorter in length. So exactly. they don't actually, in some ways they don't resonate mm -hmm. uh, with lower frequencies as long, which are the things that sort of make the, that, yeah, I like, I like that caramel, stretchy, molasses, beautiful, like golden brown um, texture. But what we do gain from that is we get these crystal bells. And actually, if you go very, very high up into the most uppermost register of the piano, the pedal doesn't even work there. No, uh, I mean, the metal doesn't even work, but it, it will just kind of sound on its own. Um, and so Jordan, I, uh, I find that you are playing with some of the inherent characteristics of the piano that allow us to have this character development. Um, and I think that's quite beautiful. Uh, once we get down to the last system of the first page, that's when we're joining into the caramel register. Mm -hmm. And for me, um, I know this is this is an excerpt. Um, and so I'm curious about what goes along around it. But I would love to see um, us be able to sit in this space a little longer to appreciate the contrast of what happens in this space when the melody and the accompaniment touch each other um, and maybe even do something where you reverse the lines in such a way that the right hand would take over what the left hand is doing and then we could put the melody into the more bass register. Sophia, I don't know if there's a place where that seems to yeah. make sense to do a quick transposition. Yeah. Yeah, something along that lines. And I think, you know, uh, if you wanted to do this, Jordan, you would just have to use a little bit of compositional magic to work the lines so that they would cross over and then maybe with some extension in the phrasing go in other spaces. This is an easy extension of a piece trick. Um, so uh, I think sometimes we're a little bit afraid of repeating when we're a young composer is because we're like, oh, we have to get so many ideas out and we can tr we can move along too quickly. But if we look at a lot of the historic repertoire, there's a lot of repetition that's happening either intentionally with just a repeat sign um, or direct repetition, or there is a repetition that is, you know, there are a few little changes here or there. And so I could imagine actually almost having a second part to the form of what you've created, where we have a transition section and then we just hear the same music, but flipped over in different ways with a few alterations. Um, and it'll get us to know the, 
the piece a little more because I, I want to stay in this sound world longer. It's really beautiful. Yeah, and I think that way that the next section will be a more sparkly, a little more glitter, um, just because we have that contrast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I would say that this is a really good roadmap uh, for a piece, and I think that you could make extensions within it to prolong some of the gestures uh, and spaces. I Sophia? Had a, I had a question about the, the time signature. Um, so it's a 6-8 uh, meter, and then we've got a quasi 3-4, which I think is great because the contrast between the right hand and the left hand um, it's very clear that you want that juxtaposition. Um, but the time signature 126, um, so putting it up in the metronome, it, um, it doesn't allow for um, more movement within the bar. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering, Nina, as a composer, if, if, if I suggest uh, maybe do like a dotted half note for the whole bar so that we can have that feel, the one feeling, if that's appropriate, or, or maybe I'm just thinking about it as a pianist, how, how it moves. Well, I think if I was conducting like something, you know, I think meter and rhythm are really tricky, especially when you're sitting in a space where you're trying to play with the tension Right. So, you know, we're like, okay, there are six eighth notes, but sometimes I want them grouped as three plus three, and sometimes as two right. plus two plus two. And we could even think of different combinations, like is it four plus two or two plus four? Or is there like a weird measure where it happens to be a five plus one, so a two plus three plus one? And, you know, there are lots of different things yeah. that we could do. And it's always like, okay, you know, does, rit does meter show the intention? What does tempo do? And so, so, and sometimes you can never get it right. Like you can worry and then there's always, there's always something where you have to make some compromises right. here or there. But I think at the end of the day, we want to be able to feel the music flow mm -hmm. wherever you want it to. And flowing doesn't mean fast and forward. It can mean stationary. It can mean backwards. It can be stuck. It can be rhythmic. It can be jarring, but sort of listening to what the music in and of itself wants to do. And so Sophia, if I was um, looking at this, I think you're I think you're very right with the idea of this pulsation. If I was to conduct it, I wouldn't even conduct it in six eight. I would conduct it in one. Right. We had da 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 I'm uh, sorry, da 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 um, and allow us to feel those big pulsations which will help build structure across the line. Right. right. Too. But your your um, comment about um, how you want to approach um, other some specific bars actually make a lot of sense. I mean, conductors do it all the time. They're in one and then seven, they're in three, and then they go back to one. That's why we need them. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, so I mean, I think it would, I think having the metronome marking would actually give a little bit more um, expressive room right. to, to like speed up a little bit at times and slow down. Right. Another thing, Jordan, that you could consider is not only having the metronome marking, but also giving a, a range. So not just saying quarter equals 126 exactly, um, but you can say something like, Quarter equals 58 to, sorry, dotted half equals 58 to 64. Yeah, that, that would give us a little more freedom, especially in a piece like this. I mean, it's not a piece like, uh, actually, like, um, like Alyssa's, mm -hmm. you know, where it has to be right, very rhythmic. But this, since it's so uh, airy and delicate, <laughs> um, to give that space, I think would uh, would be ideal for for me when I, when I see um, markings that are like let's say an eighth note equals something, then then my approach would be it has to be rhythmical and less melodic, if that makes sense. Um, and but this piece is so beautiful and so melodic, and so that's why I kind of was pushing for for that space. 
And in fact, uh, Sophia, I'm just reading through the comments in the chat now, mm -hmm. and Jordan has said, uh, great job. Oh, it was yeah. faster than I expected, but I think it worked well at that tempo. Great. Um, well, I am a little nervous here. <laughs> So I think maybe uh, in a couple of minutes, maybe we can, um, Sophia, down, if you wouldn't mind, play play it again and pull it down, and then we can notice uh, how that changes actually the feel of the music. Um, and speaking of of rhythm and tempos, if we go on to the second page, mm -hmm. there's a poco ritardando uh, at the top um, in measure twenty one. And Jordan, if you're listening on the chat, I would love to pose this question to you. I'm curious, where does that go to? Or did you mean for a downshift in tempo starting at 21? And if so, should the Poco Ritz start a little earlier and then you could provide us a metronome marking at the space? Because are we Poco Ritzing forever? Or you know, where does it go to? And I think that can be a little bit defined. So how did you interpret this, Sophia, well, um, when you I, I, I didn't, because <laughs> I didn't know where to go. So I, I'm sure if you listen back, um, I just kept it mostly in tempo and then did the writ for the two last bars. Um, but that, that was uh, a question that I did have for Jordan. So Jordan writes in the chat, it goes to the beginning of slightly past measure 28, which we haven't seen this music yet, oh, okay. where it should return to a tempo. So maybe in this second run through, right. a gradual retardando across those eight measures. Or those eight um, measures, okay, mm -hmm. okay, cool. And I think that'll also really change the character mm -hmm. uh, in this more crystalline section in the upper register that we were talking about earlier. Right. Um, I think what would be helpful is sometimes uh, composers will write poco writ and then they do these dotted lines, I guess, mini lines that go mm -hmm. all the way to the measure that they went, want you to stop. Um, and that will be helpful for, for us to, um, you know, do your vision. I absolutely agree. All right, shall we? Yes. Beautiful, Sophia, and I think it did change the character it, of the piece. Yeah, um, I think I, I think I was thrown off by the metronome marking, hence the quickness of it. Um, but this actually changes. I mean, I feel like we're strolling in a garden, you know. Yeah, me too. Um, and so I think I think that's really great feedback for Jordan um, to maybe consider making some adjustments. Uh, to the piece, Jordan. I also want to compliment you. Uh, we were talking about meter and rhythm, but I also want to talk about um, micro rhythm a little bit um, and the fluidity with which using very basic tools, uh, just duples and triples, you're able to create a sense of line where we're living outside the structure of time. So the right hand feels extremely floating um, and that it, as though it's really natural, naturally living against this um, clock of time that we have underneath in the left hand. And I think, for example, the fact that you use the quasi three against four in measure three sets that up where we're not um, 
so focused on the grid. Then in measure eight, there are the triplets. And in the following measure, right after the triplets, you decide to shift to a 16th and a dotted eighth. And it's some little change, but it really frees us from feeling like, okay, bop, 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 like that we have just duples and triples in the eighth note space. And so the 16th note space just makes the music free itself from the bar line. And I think that's gorgeous. It's also tricky to play, but. Yes, this is deceptively simple looking but you need to spend uh, some time with the, the different meters because uh, you know your your body wants to do the same movement together and then when it's different um, in both hands then you need a bit of time to um, get that in your fingers. But and every time, measure is changing. It's yes. not like you're like, okay, here I can right. uh, rub my or tap my head and oh, rub no, my belly. Just, yeah, yeah. It's like, you know, butterflies going in different flowers, I guess. <laughs> Sometimes they sit, sometimes they don't. Yeah, and it gives it a wildness um, that I find to be uh, quite beautiful. I'll just read what Jordan wrote in the chat. The intention was to create a freely moving, almost feeling like it's improvised right hand. And I think oh, it totally yeah. does that, um, which is juxtaposed with the rhythmic flowing of the left hand. Um, nice. So I think you achieved your goal. Good job, Jordan. Sophia, do you have any uh, other comments on the notation or the ability to interpret this piece? No, this is, it's great. Yeah, I think we covered um, what I was thinking. Okay, well, I'm looking forward to hearing the rest of Garden Suite. Yeah, <laughs> yeah beautiful, beautiful piece, beautiful Congratulations. Congratulations. All right, so we've got two pieces left. Um, our next one is called Cabbage written by Rebecca Robison, who is here and I think is gonna come up on stage with us. Hello. Hello, Rebecca. Um, so if you wanna say anything about your piece before we hear it, feel free. Uh, yeah, so this piece was written um, a year ago, I think. So it's kind of old and it's, supposed to be a rondo. I don't really know if I followed the rules for writing a rondo the right way, <laughs> but uh, I tried, so. Um, I kind of want to know about the title. Uh, if you look at the notes, the first couple of notes, da 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 da, it's C-A-B-B-A-G-E. Yeah. <laughs> so. That's great. Hence cabbage. I got it. I thought maybe when you said, uh, I wrote this a year ago, maybe you were one of many that started gardening and growing their own vegetables. <laughs> but we can see it. All right. All right, here we go. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you, Sophia. Rebecca, how are you feeling? Have you heard this piece performed before? I've never heard it performed. I have heard like a computer generated version of the piece, but it was completely different from that in a really good way. I really liked it. <laughs> it has real human character now. <laughs> <sighs> Wonderful. Um, so I have lots of comments, but first I want to um, compliment you on trying to take your, to bring up your own take on a stylistic form. Uh, so to, you, you know, with the idea of the Rondo and how are you gonna make that your own uh, and something new. And I think that's a, a really bold and fun compositional uh, experiment to play with. Um, and I think that you also, it's kind of like a, a romance rondo where we then get to have these really exuberant passages like measures 18, 19, and 20, um, which seem almost like the rondo has a little cadenza or something like that, uh, which, I, which I find to be fun. So the piece has a lot of personality uh, in it and I, and I find that charming. So it, it plays between, it has some of the, the idiomatic gestures of music that we know. Um, and the harmonic language is a little familiar, but sometimes not. Uh, and then we have these outbursts, which I, which I find to be fun. It's almost like the layers of unpeeling a cabbage, except we like started with a green cabbage and then we got a purple cabbage and then it was a bok choy and then it was something else. I don't know, it's cool. <laughs> which is kind of rondo, so that works. Um, so Sophia, how does this piece feel for your hands? And um, it was, um, it, it's not sight reader. Um, just because the notes are harmonically not something that we're familiar with, except for the left hand. Um, so it was hard to, I guess, just, I needed a little more time to learn it. Um, but uh, when you do um, bigger gestures, that's when it actually was more helpful for, for me. Um, like for instance, uh, I guess 18, 19, 20, um, but also 29, um, you've got the two bar phrase there. Um, the first, uh, I guess until the, the trills happened, um, the, the hairpins, um, I needed to just sit and figure the, the dynamic parts out. And I don't know if Nina, if you can help um, Rebecca, um, I don't know how to express it. Maybe, uh, maybe it would be helpful just to have hairpins. Yeah. Um, I, instead of piano, mezzo, piano, and then forte, what is it, mezzo, forte, and then p the piano. It's just a lot for the mind to process um, when you're first I, looking at the piece. I totally agree, and I think um, I, I I I agree, and I think that the especially well, I think that the dynamics are a bit over notated in this piece. Um, and Rebecca, there are some other options that you can use. Do you know about the hairpins? We can yeah. have crescendo gestures, and what that allows is a more fluid building up of lines so Sophia can feel the freedom to listen to her instrument and interpret like, oh, what do I need to do to make sure I get to Forte instead of having this very kind of like digital, like, oh, I'm gonna go up here and then I'm gonna go up here. Um, and I think this is something when you're listening to playback, the kind of dynamic markings that you wrote sound really good on the computer and kind of get the computer to do what you'd want a human to do, but humans function a little differently. And so one of like, if you really like to listen on the computer, what you can do is have a version that you compose, it's your composing score. And then when you're done with your composing score, you say, okay, now I'm going to give it to the humans. And for the humans, I need to do things that humans like to do, which are more analog and fluid. Mm -hmm. Does that make um, sense? Let me, let me just show you my, yes. my score. If you can see, I whoops, I put hairpins at the beginning here, and then I circled the forte just because it's not as 
um, it's something that you really wanted, right? Mm -hmm. And then if, if then that will give me space to um, look at all the other things in the piano bar, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, and it allows Sophia to focus on the notes and the rhythms and just have a visual cue that says like, oh, get softer, get louder, get softer, get louder. Um, you know, it's kind of like, imagine, I don't know if you've ever like memorized a poem or, you know, or if you're memorizing a piece of music, you know that at some point, like it's still comfortable to have the score there, but you're not reading everything for the first time. You're like, oh, that shape means I do this. And that's a shape that reminder that I that I do this, or I have to like you know it's kind of like checkpoints for yourself, and that's why you know that's why we have this weird music notation because otherwise we could actually say like C A B flat B flat B flat A G and write this out in text. <laughs> um, yeah, and then that way it will give me the freedom to focus on the cabbage notes, right? Inform that. Um, and so another thing that I want to point out, um, and I'm going to point this out, and it's um, I want to say it's not meant to be a criticism, but I want to know if you're aware of it. Um, and it's one of the things that I think makes this music a little, let's say, quirky. Like I said, it's like a rondo that we think we know, but like we totally don't know it. It's like it's a rondo from another world. Um, is the way that you go against some of the standard voice leading of melodic lines. So even this like opening gesture uh, in the right hand, if you could play it, please, Sophia. Should I continue? Oh, sorry. Uh, no, no, no. It's just the first, yeah, the first measure into that E flat. Like that E flat is the first thing, that melodic line, it's not where we expect it to go, that leap down. So we just had all of this stepwise motion. And then the last three notes, B flat, A, G, were going down. So we either expect to have another note downward, or we expect to maybe stay on the G, we could move to an F, we could stay in the G, we could hop back up, we could leap upwards somewhere would be the standard thing to do. Um, and instead we were like, oh, it's like we're going down a hill and they we're like, oh, let's jump a little bit more down the hill. And it's like this kind of jarring surprise. Um, and it's something that if you were trying to write in the style of one of the classical composers, they would not they would be like, oh no, that's against our style, we don't do that. Um, so just to be um, aware that, that that's a thing. There's an, another thing that happens a couple of times where you have this thing called parallel fifths and octaves in some of the uh, cadence resolutions. And I heard them and now I can't find them at the score. Um, uh, looking, looking, looking. Yes. Which measure is that? So that's a two four bar at 13. Yes, measure 13. So do you know about this, Rebecca? Uh, parallel fifths. Parallel fifths and parallel octaves. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if we look in measure 13, um, you'll see you have the trill on the F on beat two, um, or actually it starts earlier. You have the B flat in the upper voice. And then in the left hand, there's also a B flat in the upper and the lower voice. And then you skip down in both hands to this F. And then in the next measure in 14, we skip down parallel to the E flat. And so that's a lot of leaping. And so what happens is we start to hear, the, like the reason why parallel fifths, everybody is like, oh, we shouldn't do them. 
is, um, and it comes from the idea that we have two separate, two or more separate lines. So as I was talking about the other pieces, I was like, oh, you have different characters at play. And so the parallel fifth is like, we have different characters. And then suddenly for some reason that we don't understand, they all morphed into the same character. And we're like, how did they do that? Now all the music is just one character. And then they split again and we're really, uh, like sonically, we're freaked out by this because our brains are tracking all of the lines subconsciously. And then we kind of think that we're a little, like, we're like, what did we do wrong? I thought there were multiple lines and now they're gone. It's, it's almost a subconscious thing. Um, and this is why they're so jarring. Then you'll see that once we graduate out of, I mean, it's, they actually even happen all through the classical period, but let's go all the way to punk rock. Um, and in punk rock, we have entire like power chords, which are just octaves, octaves, da, 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 and then we just kind of shift parallel octaves and fifths all over the place. And the question is like, well, why is that allowed? And nobody gets upset about that. And that's allowed because we never heard them as separate lines to begin with. What we heard that as was just like one juicy chord moving to another juicy chord, moving to another juicy chord. So we're never like, ah, yes, there were like three voices. And then they moved into the three same voices. They all collapse into one thing. Um, and that's the difference. So I just want you to be aware of the fact that this can sound, what you've written could sound super empty. Um, so for example, if we could think about like, okay, how could you rewrite this? Um, so you can think about the chords that you have in measures 13 and 14. Um, and so in the downbeat of measure 13, you have Fs and B flats. So we have these open fourths, fifths, depending what the voicing is. So you could introduce, if you wanted, another third in there, a D. Mm -hmm. So for example, and if we look at the previous line, we had the E natural in the bass line. So going down to a D in the basis of bass notes might be a good idea. Um, and then instead of repeating the F on beat two, we could just hold on to that from the previous note or even skip down to an F or you can just have the chord once and then we hear the trill. And then in measure 14, you want the melodic line for sure to go up to the E flat, but what other note could the triple, uh, the three note arpeggio on beat one in measure 14 go to? Mm. D, maybe if you change the E. Um, it could, but if we look at your chord, you have E flat, G and B flat. So you have an E flat major chord. So we could just start it on a different one of those notes. You could start on the G for example. And that gets rid of the parallel octaves while actually not changing the music that you've written very much at all. And so I think would be a really good idea is for you to go and be like, okay, I'm gonna be that annoying parallel octave and parallel fifth police and with a highlighter, print this out and go through all of them. And then say like, okay, how could I like Jenga jiggle my notes around? Um, so that you're using the same bricks, but they're just in a different location and see if that makes the piece feel any different to you. Um, I think that could be a fun idea. Um, another thing I wanna ask, and this goes uh, a little bit with the conversation we were just having um, before about the temple markings uh, in Jordan's piece is to look at, you have, um, just like the dynamics sometimes are a little sudden. For example, in measure 20, there's a retardando and then a quarter equals 80 marking. And so I'm guessing you want a retardando two quarter equals 80. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right, it's not like a sudden like quarter equals 80. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So in that case, that should move over to the end of the measure to show that that's where you're retardandoing to. And then you would start it at tempo. 
we can do the we can talk about the same thing for measure 33 is there a retardando oh, sorry 34 is there a retardando into that quarter equals 80 change um so i think that one there's a retardando starting on like measure 32 going mm -hmm. to 80 and then it goes to the original tempo at quarter equals 115. Okay, cool. So one of the things that I personally like, and I don't know, Sophia, how you feel about this, but sometimes it's funny to make a dramatic tempo shift in the middle of a measure. And you kind of have to play the meter police with yourself in this case and be like, okay, right. you know, we we're talking about meter before, like, do I have to change the meter here? Like, you know, it's also okay if you wanted measure 34 to be a nine eight bar, or even you can make this a 12 eight bar. And I think that measure 35 is where the quarter equals 115 should start and you could, I think, Sophia, you would interpret this as like, oh, it's like a pickup, right? You're like accelerating the tempo. Right. Yes. Um, so I don't know, Rebecca, if that's clear. And then I guess this, the, another question is on the last system of the piece, where does the retardando start? It starts right after the trail. Okay. okay. And I'm gonna make one little notation thing. I would love for the penultimate measure in the right hand to put, to voice this as B flat, E flat, G, B flat. So that Where that A, so this is the second to last measure, right after you have that A quarter equals 90, I would love for the B flat to be the destination. It's like we get to this A at the end of the piece and we're like, okay, where's it gonna go? Yep. So yeah. B flat high. And so, so this- Or to go down to a G. Oh, okay, to a G, okay, so. Yeah. Here's the original. And then if we go to a G, it'll sound like this. Or yeah, so either one, because um, I feel like the leap down to the E flat after the A, um, it's it's such a strange interval and it feels like we just let out all of the air from the balloon. So I kind of feel like going up higher to the B flat will be really exciting. Um, and then you could keep shooting up so that the D is maybe even higher than that in the next measure. And then that last chord is revoiced to be uh, an octave higher. Mm -hmm. And that way we feel like when we get to the end of the piece, we're like, yeah. You know, another thing I could see is like where you're like trying to like put everything into a small spot, but then I wouldn't have that A natural hanging out of above there because our ears remember that. Like our our ears always remember the highest and lowest notes. And if they're unresolved, we get to this next harmony where the A natural doesn't belong at all. And I'm just kind of sitting there, I'm like, where did it go? It's still there. I hear it. I hear it in the echo of my ear. And so we need to take care of that. Should I play just a couple of bars at the end? Just so that, that we can hear great. the new. Yeah. Um, so here's from the uh, from the 115 uh, metronome working. Yeah, I like yeah, that a lot, it, yeah. It does feel more final, yeah, really interesting. 
Um, Sophia, would it be possible for us to run through it one more time with or without the changes, whatever is most comfortable for you? Oh, sure. Yeah, but I, I will put the writs in uh, the retardandos. Is that okay, Re Re Rebecca? Yeah? Okay. Wonderful. Thanks, Sophia. Rebecca, do you have any questions for Sophia? No, um, you did a really good job. I really liked hearing you play my piece. Thank you. Well, thank you for writing it. Cabbage. Love yeah, it. wonderful job. Um, super, super fun piece and great feedback and performance. Okay, so we have one more piece this evening. Um, this piece is called Constellations, written by Soren Smith, and they're not here with us on the stream this evening, so I think we could just go ahead.
Bravo, that was a beautiful, beautiful performance. And I feel like I'm on edge in suspense. That, that end keeps us hanging. Yes. He does. They do, yeah. Um, and in this way, I, I, I find this, it's, it's interesting to me, this is, um, it's like Eric Satie, but more like it goes further. Yes. It, uh, yeah, thinking about that piece exactly. Yeah, and I was wondering about, um, actually, a um, question for Soren, um, about pedaling. So if they wanted this, um, so pedal throughout from the beginning on each bar or on the second beat. Just because of the slur on the second beat, it made me question what they, uh, what they wanted. So that, that would just be something, a seedling in there to make it a, a little bit clearer. I totally agree that this is one of the places where you could interpret it uh, either way. And perhaps um, it changes along the course of the piece as well. That's another option um, as the yeah. lines grow more. Um, right. I was actually curious about um, something. So we have the, the C, G, C, G, uh, pedal, bass pedal oscillation, which is really beautiful that sets up the piece. And then in measure um, 10, 11, 12, 13, we get the first uh, change of that. And we also uh, kind of in an unexpected way, and it's really like, it's gorgeous to hear this low register of the piano. We have this F octave down, and then we have the rhythmic pattern continues but then in the subsequent measure, we have the C again. And I'm kind of curious, Sophia, if you would play this passage once, but don't play that C in the subsequent so we'll measure. The C on measure. Okay, sure. So 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, not to play that C in 14. Um, and then maybe one version where we don't play the F octaves again in the sub in the following measure, so that this F that we had in measure thirteen becomes this like huge breath of it of interruption, and we're like, oh, where did the pattern go? And then when it finally resolves in measure sixteen, we'll be like, ah, yes, we know what happened. Okay. Um, here's upbeat to nine. <laughs> Yeah, something to that. And maybe, you know, I'm thinking to even revoicing measure 16 so that C is an octave higher, um, or maybe the pedaling is different. Uh, or, you know, or to think of some way of carrying over the, the texture so that when we arrive again at the C at 16, it's really exciting. Yeah, I think that's a solution. Yeah, that C and the higher octave on 16 actually works really well to resolve into uh, 17. And it feels nice too, because your your left hand is going higher and then suddenly it just kind of drops. Wow. Yeah, and I think what that registral shift does is it keeps us thinking about that C living within the harmony of the F chord instead of our remembering that the C is a C minor chord. So when we shift back down to the lower register, we read C minor because of what happened before. But when we put it up higher, it just becomes part an ex a rhythmic extension of the F. Yeah. I think also the, um, I guess the danger with um, the C sign, you could kind of feel seesaw-ish, right? So if you go change the, the range of it, there's a, a variety instead of keep on going mm -hmm. like that. 
Yeah, I agree. Um, and I think that maybe there are some um, one or two other spots like Soren, I would uh, encourage you to explore this idea further in the piece and see if there are a couple of other places where you just want to float a little bit or suspend the pulsation disbelief so that we feel really satisfied when we get it again. I think so that also, sorry, go ahead. Play, um, the interpretation of, of the, maybe even the trill at, um, I don't know what number, three, four, five, six, thirty six. So if we. If that's something that a performer could play around with a holding on, suspending, and then coming down in that trill. How, um, can you talk a little bit, Sophia, about your experience with the improvisation section? This is, um, I'll be honest, this is my least favorite thing when I see composers say, performers, do your thing. And we're just like, I need rules. I need a roadmap. Um, this is why we have you composers. Um, but I did have fun. Because um, uh, I was just, it, it forced me to think about the mood that was created before, right? So, um, and hopefully I, I did that. Um, but I did have a question about harmony because um, I did have trouble um, going back to the A flat when it arrived at 47. Um, it just, it felt a little awkward. Um, and that's where the, the danger of, I guess trusting a performer to do this when we don't have the uh, the knowledge and the education to figure that out. So I mean, I, I wrote some things out, but it, it was basically the two last bars. starts getting a little uncomfortable. Um, I, and I agree. And it's almost, uh, in some ways, we can think about it as like a cadenza section. So if we're thinking about a concerto, you know, there's a harmonic set up for the start of the cadenza. And then there's always the transition at the end where it's like, okay, trill, and the orchestra kind of gets back into motion and exactly. it starts to go. And that's what takes you out. So when some when somebody's composing a cadenza or when a performer is improvising a cadenza, which is something that happens too, they know where they need to end up right before we're back in the mix. And so it's kind of like guidelines. It's like do whatever you want, but you know, here's your here's the passage out of this. So I think maybe writing uh, a since since uh, measures forty five and forty six are repeated. They could be repeated and then there could be one, or maybe there's two, instead of repeated, it's just four measures where we have the harmonies duplicated. And on the last one, Soren, you can write us out maybe two or three notes in the right hands at the end that bring us into how you envision the resolution to measure 47. Yes, that would be very, very helpful. So yeah, yeah, because I didn't know how to, how to resolve it. Uh, it's, it's you know, another, and, I was like, oh. and of course, I'm gonna make it an interpretation going. <laughs> it's just to give that space, I was like, oh, this is so long. I'm so sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's how I feel. But writing out just the two last bars would be very helpful. And I think so that the best it, of both worlds. Yeah, the best of both worlds. And it's important to also understand that when, um, as a composer, if you're gonna write an imp improvisatory section for musicians who are, as far as you know, might only play classical, whatever that means, music, whatever that means, um, right? There's such a wide variety of approaches. Like some people only wanna see what's on the page. Some people have developed 
really intense improvisatory practices, some in tonal languages, some in free improvisatory languages, some in experimental languages, like there's lots of different ways that this could go. And I think it's important as a composer to care for the musicians that you're writing for. Um, and to understand that there might be a varying degree of comfort and or skill level in improvisation. So something that you could also do is provide an osia section or an appendix in the score that gives an alternate version for someone who might feel totally uncomfortable and like get mega stage fright at the idea of having to improvise. And then it also gives room for someone who wants to just really go for it in some and do something totally virtuosic and incredible to, to do it and right. not feel restricted by the notation either. Yeah, I, I love that. I love that option. And I think, um, so let's say this constellation piece becomes part of my regular repertoire. Then once that's done, um, I would probably be brave enough because I know the piece so well that I'll be like, okay, I can do this improvisation. I can I I can feel it in my bones. This these harmonies. So I'll I'll do it. But maybe probably at the first or second performance, I'd probably just look at the the optional part and play it exactly as mm -hmm. is. Um, but I think giving that option to the performer is is very nice and very kind. <laughs> I mean, that's like what this, I mean, as you said, Sophia rightly yourself, like that's what the score is for. The score is there to give you a framework to be an artist. Um, and so I think it's really important as composers to make sure that we really respect and care for the musicians we're writing for and empower them to explore in all sorts of ways. You know, if, if we can also think about, if we go back, um, I've been mentioning this several times, but uh, to more historic piano repertoire, keyboard repertoire, um, there's a lot of um, room for embellishment on repeats uh, and stylistic changes that can happen where the score was kind of just a lead sheet in some ways for the second time around. Um, and, and I like that, um, that this piece uh, by Soren plays with that a little bit. Um, yes, yeah. I mean, I love uh, any repeats in any second movement, and then when the violinist starts playing around, and then the pianist starts reacting to what they were improvising within the framework of what the composer gave you, it's very interesting as a player, and probably, and I'm sure as a as a listener too. One notation thing that I didn't realize, but I'm just looking at right now and it's glaring me in the face. Uh, measure 56, it should be piano subito, if you want to make sure, because there's this big crescendo. The question is, where does the crescendo go to? And it might be like, is it, um, I, I believe you were at mezzo forte before, is it a fortissimo, is it a triple forte? And then suddenly we get this big contrast down piano subito. Because right now it looks like it could be a mistake. Like, oh, is that a finale or a Sibelius that, for, turn the diminuendo around another way. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Sophia, are there any other points that you want to bring up? No, sorry, you did a great job. Yeah. Took us to the outer space. Yeah, beautiful job. Um, I just want to say one more huge, huge thank you to both uh, Sophia and Nina um, for beautiful playing and for some wonderful feedback for all of the composers. Um, this is something I wish I had mentioned at the beginning, but another really cool thing about this event uh, that we just all had is that the composers involved were from all over. You know, that's one of the really cool things about, you know, that maybe we all sort of discovered a little bit during the pandemic is doing virtual events like this, you know, we're not limited by um, by space. So we have composers, I'm not gonna remember exactly where all of you are from, but I know that there are composers all the way out in Seattle and California and all the way in Ohio, places in between. Um, so really cool um, in that way. I want to invite everyone to uh, join us again for our future 
um, virtual solo instrument composition workshops. Uh, like I mentioned at the beginning, same time next week and in subsequent weeks. Um, next week, we have clarinet with Alexandra Gardiner. Um, October 19th, we have viola with Nina again. And on October 26th, we have violin with Inti Thigis Uzueta. Um, and there are a couple more farther out, um, cello and saxophone as well. And for any students or educators who might be watching, submissions are still open for those subsequent uh, workshops. So please encourage uh, students to submit to them, you know, so that they can get this experience as well. Um, the full schedule you can find on our website so you don't have to listen to me rattle it all off. And the, the last biggest thank you I want to give is to all of our student composers. Thank you so much for sharing your music with us and for, um, you know, just generously receiving feedback on it and, you know, offering your, your art to us. That's so, so exciting for us to get to see. And I'm so excited to see where all of you go next with composition. So I think that's all we have for tonight. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, uh, Nina and Sophia, and we'll see you at the next one. Thank you.